Hello, my name is Taya Graham and I am a reporter for the Real News Network Baltimore Bureau. Obviously, like many women across the country, I am moved by the Me Too movement. Not just the stories of the women who have suffered abuse, but the recognition of just how deeply entrenched sexism and sexual exploitation is in the places where women work and live. And I've also been concerned that experiences of women of color with harassment have not been given the proper attention. As a reporter, I've had the privilege of covering the state capital of Annapolis. It's the place where state leaders gather to make the laws that govern the lives of Marylanders across the state. But recently, serious allegations of abuse have surfaced, and the response to the complaints has been lackluster at best. So as a woman and a journalist, I had the honor of sitting down with three women who were willing to share their firsthand experience with sexual harassment and the consequences of standing up. I was so moved by their courage that I have decided to run all the interviews without cutting a single second. I feel the stories they shared are too important to abbreviate or edit in any way. Therefore, I will be posting these pieces unabridged over the next few days. I hope they will help to heal the wounds of the women who have suffered and begin a dialogue on how to address the lax attitudes and legal barriers that make the exploitation of women so pervasive in our state capital. Either way, I remain committed as a journalist and a woman of color to bringing these stories to light. My guests are Brittany Oliver, a women's rights activist and director of the social justice organization Not Without Black Women, Delegate Angela Angel, and Nina Smith, a communications consultant and former Annapolis staffer. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having, Thank you. having us. Uh, Nina, I know you worked as a staffer in Annapolis. Can you tell me a little bit about if you're someone who experienced sexual harassment in Annapolis, what's your recourse? What, what, what would you have to do to try to get that predator punished or at least to report it? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I mean, you know, I worked in Annapolis back, I uh, started in 2004 as an intern um, when I was attending Morgan State University. And, you know, you kind of come to Annapolis, and this is part of the testimony I gave um, earlier this year. You come to Annapolis and you're kind of like, okay, you know, there's certain things that you should expect, right? Like, um, you know, don't go out so late or, you know, try to stay in groups or, you know, that sort of thing. And they, they, they're these general warnings that you kind of hear generally, wow. right? Um, when you start, when you first start out. And so, um, you know, over the years, you experience those different things and then you kind of um, learn to pass that advice along. Right. Um, you know, when it comes to um, just the rampant culture and how um, these things have kind of allowed, been allowed to kind of percolate, um, there was no, the process for reporting this was really unclear. Okay. Like I, I worked there for eight years and I had no real idea about the recourse I had, um, other outside of, um, in, in the policy as it stands currently, right before this law goes into effect, um, you have to report through the political offices. So you have to report to the chief of staff of the speaker or the chief of staff of um, the Senate president, okay. both very political offices, mm -hmm. um, both angled in, in, the way the policy is written currently, it, it's really very protective of um, the abusers or the accused. Okay. The process is tilted towards them. Um, you know, even who you report to, you report to, um, there's a human uh, resources um, manager in the Department of Legislative Services that you report to, because it's a human service, um, human uh, resources ma um, issue. And so some of that kind of currently, it's just, it's a very murky structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, 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 and, it, and there's no independent um, person, entity that exists that can kind of say, all right, looking at this without the politics involved, without us trying to protect this particular seat in this jurisdiction mm -hmm. or this particular delegation chair, you know, um, you're, you're more focused on what happened here. Right. Um, the, you know, the accused felt like, or the accuser felt like there, there was something inappropriate that happened here. There was something, there was some sort of breach of conduct, um, okay. uh, of trust, of comfortability in a space. Um, and so there's that piece. And then uh, in addition to all of that, I mean, no one really knows the scope of the problem. There are no numbers. Yeah. There are no numbers. They're, there, they're there are no, there's they're no collected. numbers of the number of sexual harassment cases that have been filed or reported in Annapolis. No complaints. No, there's no, no. way to discover that information. They haven't that even is been keep, they haven't even been keeping it. No. So, so it's not even like they're not turning it over. They've not been keeping it. Right. 
That is absolutely extraordinary. We weren't even taking the basic steps to, I mean, trainings were happening once every four years for legislators. And the last training that happened, if I'm not mistaken, the um, attorney general's office had to step in and do the training because the trainer from the national, um, I, I forget the name of the entity, who usually does the trainings didn't show up. So, you know, I mean, they're just the training structure wasn't there. The reporting structure wasn't there. Um, if you're an accuser, you don't feel safe because it's very political. Right. It just it, all around it was a problem. And, you know, we looked at it very closely. And um, as things were developing, starting, I think it was December, where this started to bubble up a little bit on social media that folks were talking about their, their um, experiences with sexual harassment in Annapolis. And, you know, folks came out on social media, but they didn't name names and, you know, they just kind of highlighted that this is a problem. So we started examining it and we realized that the policy was just, it was, it was laughable. Right, and, and it sounds like it makes it very open to the the person who is doing the accusing to be open to retaliation. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. It sounds like that makes I mean, it very easy. Everything in Annapolis is about relationships. Yeah. Everything. Every job I had in Annapolis to some degree involved me interfacing with legislators, having to like um, talk to them about certain support we needed, um, if we were going to be in their district, you know, reaching out to them. And it gives them a lot of access to you mm -hmm. uh, in a way that you can't just throw up the barrier or not return that text. You have to return the text, right? Okay. Because you don't want them being pissy with you when you have a piece of legislation or you need their public support on an issue. Right, because it goes back to, like I said, the way hidden retaliation can be done. Mm -hmm. If you didn't return the text, right. you know, who knows what can happen to your bill? Who knows, like, when you're trying to testify or you're trying to move something? It's, right. it, it's innumerable the ways that someone can come after you. Wow, I, I know that you said that you testified, which meant that you had, as a staffer, experienced sexual harassment in Annapolis. Do you mind sharing a little bit of that story with us now? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll share what I testified about. Um, you know, just that I, I experienced um, different forms. A lot of it was inappropriate jokes. Um, I had one legislator tell me that he wanted to perform a sexual act on me. Um, I, there was another legislator who I knew was married, um, text me after midnight to come to his hotel room. Um, you know, there is, um, I, I'm not into oysters, but you know, there are oyster receptions all the time in Annapolis, that's our, our thing. And at a reception, you know, there, there was this group and they were encouraging me to, you know, slip the oysters and it's a powerful aphrodisiac. And it's just like, okay, this is, this is- Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. To say the least. To say the least. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the, the, you know, just talking about the worst situation I encountered um, was outright assault, um, sexual assault on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. um, a legislator came up behind me, you know, made a very inappropriate comment about, oh, I didn't know you were packing all this back here. And like, um, you know, it was uncomfortable. I was trying to move and, wow. you know, he became erect. It was not a, oh, God. And, and I know this individual's wife. I've met his children. Uh -huh. I know his brother. I, like, I know these folks, you know? Yeah. Um, and they basically raised me because I was in Annapolis for eight years starting in college. Right. You were basically a baby when yeah. you showed up there. Absolutely, oh. absolutely. That is just, that's just terrible. Um, you, with, you with Not Without Black Women, with mm -hmm. your help, with your help, have managed to pass a piece of legislation to address some of the issues that what sounds like there was no accountability for sexual harassment in Annapolis previously. You've tried to bring in some accountability, maybe even some independent oversight. Can you tell me a little bit about the legislation that you drafted and successfully passed? So what I can tell you is that for, for my particular role um, in getting this bill passed um, was again, um, through Not Without Black Women, was to provide the advocacy aspect to this. Um, so what we decided to do is we, we all came up collectively that made the decision to, um, to do a social media campaign, um, which also involved creating a petition um, online um, so that we could use it as a way to uh, spread the word about what the, about what we're, we were working on. Um, we also started to uh, get get stories um, from other from from survivors who wanted to speak up about what they were going going through, but didn't have an avenue um, or a way to talk about it. So we created um, a a, um, a submission. 
um, document for folks to be able to submit their stories. So we've also been collecting stories. Um, on the last day of session, we wanted to have a um, Sign and Die Me Too action where we went to different bars and um, it was myself, Nina, and some other uh, uh, other um, supporters of Not Without Black Women that came to Annapolis so that we could, and this was my first signing day. I had never, I had been involved in the, in the process, uh, political advocacy um, or political activism in Baltimore and Annapolis for a long time. It was my first time going to Sani Die. And so what we did was we um, were there and we went to different bars and um, tried to watch to see if we could see any inappropriate behavior that was happening. Um, this kind of work was inspired by the work that I have previously done. I'm the former co-director of Hollaback Baltimore, mm -hmm. which is a gender-based uh, street harassment, anti-street harassment organization that's in Baltimore. I'm, I'm a now, now a board member, but these are, this is the, this is what we did. We would go into different, uh, we, we trained bar, different bars and venues in Baltimore staff on how to identify sexual abuse and harassment that's happening right in the, right in their establishments because people just don't know what they don't know how to identify they don't know what it looks like and they don't know what to do so what kind of harassment if any did you see in these bars so what I can say is that um, there is definitely um, the the culture there is not isn't is not different from a lot of different spaces that I have observed. Um, it's very similar to you know different um, scenes in Baltimore such as um, down, downtown Baltimore power plant. <laughs> oh, wow. The I'm power thinking plant. About. So on the last day of session for Sunny Die, myself, uh, Nina, and some other supporters of Not Without Black Women decided to go to Annapolis so that we could kind of observe space and, and see how, see if we could see any type of uh, inappropriate behavior that was that was happening, especially with the bill, um, especially with the getting the getting the bill passed. And so what I can say is that I saw a lot of inappropriate touching, grabbing, um, I saw... And this is between uh, politicians and staffers mm -hmm. and lobbyists? Is that, yes. is that the group of people you're looking at? Yes, okay. it, it was um, 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 delegates, le just legislators, just staff okay. um, that, you know, a, a lot of drinking and a lot of just, it, it seemed in, in that space very, um, packed tightly there um, it, it's normally an event that everyone who works in Annapolis attends so there's like a lot of people in one space at one time and so I um, what I was able to see was just a lot of inappropriate grabbing and touching and hugging and um, you know just you know um, groping Wow. Groping is what I is what I witnessed. On the day that you helped successfully pass legislation to deal mm -hmm. with sexual harassment in Annapolis, mm -hmm. you witnessed sexual harassment. I witnessed it there, and wow. and again, it, this being my first time being a part of of Sunny Die, um, I was actually what I mentioned earlier about this being a risk for specifically for Black women. Mm -hmm. You know, I um, I was worried if anyone would recognize me as a person who had been talking about this issue over over session. Um, and I actually, I had some encounters where folks, where there were some legislators who just walked up to me and started talking to me about sexual harassment. And that's what gave me the cue mm -hmm. that they recognized me uh -huh. from the advocacy that we were doing on, on the bill. Yeah. And so there were jokes and things like that being made. And, you know, I kind of just, for my own protection, I, you know, just, you know, gave a nod. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, was just saying, you know, if, if you supported it, you know, try, try not to go into too much detail because that really wasn't my goal was to sit and have a whole conversation about the bill. Um, but, but what I'm trying to uplift is that as a black woman talking about issues around rape culture, I couldn't tell whether or not the person was actually interested because they cared about the issue or if they were, they were taunting, if they were oh, trying I to intimidate, you know. Um, and so when you're a black woman and you're talking about this, especially in a space like Annapolis um, and, and, you know, I think that it goes to what Angela was saying, that like Angela was saying about the about the about the backlash that you receive and the intimidation and um, the risk. It it really is a risk, and I feel for myself, 
you know, I I am a woman for, with my own experience. I experienced a lot of sexual harassment on in public space, which is why I started leading Hollaback Baltimore. And it was some of the most impactful work I had ever done in my entire career. But trying to create more safer spaces for women in public space um, is what I was really, um, has always been a passion of mine. And so um, I think that even more so now, the stakes have gotten a lot higher. Right. My career is on the line. My, um, you know, and, and all those, all of that stuff is, is a risk. However, I am more dedicated. I feel like I am at the most vulnerable I've ever been in the work that I'm doing right now. And so if speaking up and supporting women like Nina and like Delegate Angela um, and, and other women survivors, um, if that's what, if it means speaking up and, and, and giving that support, because that's one thing we don't have. We don't have a lot of support. Um, it was, I can say during session, it was, um, people started to catch on um, by like retweeting us, mm -hmm. our petition and reaching out, you know, asking, am, am, are we okay? What kind of support do we need? But it took a really long time okay. to gain that support. Um, and it looks, the issue looks more threatening to, you know, th this is an issue that white women, this, the, this issue is like the face of, uh, that white women often. Absolutely. You know, and so. The face of this, of this movement, of the, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what is this black woman, you know, this young black woman running around Annapolis, <laughs> running around Baltimore talking about rape culture? Right. You know, um, and because I've been doing this work for a long time, I've just learned how to build tough skin around it and focus on the issue. Right. Now, it does sound like you were handling like the social media, public relations aspect of making sure this bill came to pass. You offered what was obviously really important testimony on behalf of this bill. But can you, Delegate, tell me a little bit about how this bill is going to change things? So we know that it made it very difficult for some a staffer to be able to report sexual harassment. There's no numbers kept on sexual harassment. So can you tell me now how this bill changes that? So um, one of the biggest um, victories in the bill is that there is an independent investigator okay. um, that is involved that you can go to. That was crucial because part of what the issue was was you were going to, you were being required to go to folks who were already politically involved and motivated. And what, what people have to understand as to why that matters is, for instance, the, the leadership team, which is made up the heads of committees, mm -hmm. the heads of delegation, um, they have a large responsibility for making bills pass in Annapolis. Like a lot of times, if a member of leadership doesn't like a bill, they can draw it without any questions. And when I mean draw it, it means that they can make it to where it just basically goes away. Mm -hmm. You have a public hearing on it, it doesn't have to go to a vote for a committee. It never has to be, it never sees the light of day. That's why it's wow. called drawer, because you technically would say it's in their drawer. Okay. And, and so, and they can do that without any question. And in fact, if you question a bill being drawered, there's retaliation that goes against that. Wow. Um, and, and, and that's, that's pro forma, like that's, that's, that's the way Annapolis works. Um, and there's also a monetary aspect where if you look, most leadership people, people in positions of leadership, raise a huge amount of money. And that money then goes back into helping other Democrats get elected. So they're fundraisers. And so, so they have a lot of power and responsibility, and there is a system set up to support them and to make sure they stay in power, because mm -hmm. they're how the entire power dynamic stays in, in Annapolis. So part of the issue of, of, and why it's so important to have an independent investigator, because if these are the people that are actually doing something against, that are, that are sexually harassing people, that are assaulting people, the way the structure in Annapolis is set up is that to protect that person, because they have money in their account, they're holding bills, they can do all of these things. So as a victim, it's, it's, it's bigger than, it's, it's more than David and Goliath, you know? Right. It's, it's, it's huge. Um, so what we've done now is an independent investigator who is not politically motivated or politically active, okay. um, can, you can go to them now and they can do an investigation. There's also a tracking system. So for instance, um, even if, say, 
someone is, is being reported but they keep being unfounded, it's now tracked and so you can begin to look at that right. and say, well, okay, why does this person have four complaints, five complaints and everything's being unfounded? Right. Okay, something has to be there. Um, you know, that those are some of the big issues and things that were, were passed. Um, I'll also add that the, there's a training component. And yes. they, they started, okay. they started mm -hmm. to formalize the training component, which is important, right? Because you need to know the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the issue in Annapolis. It's, it's really murky. Relationships are like, you know, they've, it's, yeah. it's very shadowy. And so um, it kind of makes the lines very clear um, in, in ways that we just haven't had before. And I, I think that's also very important so that everybody knows you know, this is inappropriate, this isn't. Yeah. Um, and, and now I need to go ahead and report it to the Joint Ethics Committee, and the Joint Ethics Committee will refer it to an independent investigator. Um, and, and just having that very clear, independent of the political structure process, I think is gonna really help expose a lot of the, um, the uh, perpetrators, the um, predators that we have in Annapolis. That's the way it's designed. Exactly, and then also even with the Joint Ethics Committee, one of the, it, it clarifies and makes sure that it's clear what their role is in regards to sexual harassment. Um, one of the things that I had heard from people who even if they had tried to file something dealing with the legislator, legislator um, what had happened is the Ethics Committee can say, regardless of whether or not we even find that this is factual or valid or we, we believe you, we, this is outside our purview. And so therefore there's nothing okay. that can be done and we'll refer you to, you can see outside. But you know, once you've kind of put everything on the line and you've reported it to somewhere and you get that type of a letter, you're not typically gonna go anywhere else. Okay. And so this, this per places a more clear defined responsibility on what that committee's role is in processing sexual harassment claims. Um, I also just wanna be clear about the process and um, you know, to also to also okay. prevent to prevent also any other type of backlash, yeah. right? Okay. So, um, is that that the um, women's caucus had began looking into this, okay. um, and that's in, where I testified, in, okay. in, and she testified in in 2016. They began looking into this, and and because a lot of us um, had talked about it amongst ourselves, and a lot of us had shared stories. Um, you know, like I said, I could go on and on about things that are even criminal. Um, that have happened to other legislators. I don't because I respect that th that's their story to share. Um, but so we all knew about this. So the Women's Caucus picked this up about a year and a half ago. Um, and they first started collecting stories um, and, and, and seeing and going to leadership and asking for help. They then even formalized the process and started kind of a, a subcommittee that was looking at this. They wrote a report. Um, and the bill itself came out of the, the actual bill, House Bill 1342, was something that was drafted um, as a result of all of that work. And so I do always want to, you know, be clear to give credit where credit is due, sure. that, 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 that the bill came out of kind of that work in the committee. I will also be clear that um, I never sat on those meetings. Um, I didn't attend them and I didn't participate. And I'll say honestly, one of the reasons I didn't was because of the retaliation, um, because I also, um, I'll be honest, and even, I mean, Nina and Brittany can, can say, during this whole process, um, I've been fairly jaded. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I, I'm pl I, was, I was very pleasantly surprised that the bill passed, even, even when it crossed back from the Senate and it had all the amendments, and the Senate made it a stronger bill, mm -hmm. which shocked me. Yeah. Um, because oh. some of the things that we advocated for in the House, like the independent investigator, mm -hmm. the House did not put that in. And so, wow. and, we, and the Senate put it and back the in. Senate, the Senate put, put it, it back there, in, yeah. which was wow. shocking right. because in the process, the Senate had seen more resistant, mm -hmm. and they had seen more kind of, you know, um, the Senate uh, president, Senator Mike Miller, had basically. It seemed like uh, the way he was talking, uh, he there was a letter that was basically passed around by women legislators. Um, I think. 57 out of the 60 women legislators in Annapolis signed the letter basically saying that, well, we, you know, yeah, this behavior is inappropriate, but, you know, we're still doing great work. And they did this in the middle of the wow. bill moving. Mm -hmm. And the Senate president stands on the Senate floor and says, I have this letter here. So it kind of gives the impression that, oh, you know, it, this means nothing's wrong. We don't really need to pass legislation. Right. We don't really need to go that far mm -hmm. to and put it into actual law right. that, that these changes need to be made and we need to create this space, safe space. Um, it, it came across as if as if it was 
it wasn't going to go anywhere. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and there was there were a lot of late nights agonizing. I, I know I, I texted <laughs> yes. folks pretty late. Um, there's one reporter I texted pretty late, and I, I apologize to her about that. <laughs> Just because of the concerns about this process. Um, you know, Ariana Kelly was the lead sponsor of, of 1342. Um, mm -hmm. She also had a, a bill that passed um, that provides um, Tarana Burke's consent course um, for elementary school kids. So they're, we're even wow. starting earlier. That's uh, great. Like, like I said before, for me, the biggest issue is consent, right? And we're not teaching um, each other how to respect our boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm not interested in you, don't touch me. Right. If I tell you I'm not comfortable, mm -hmm. you need to move away. Right. Or you need to acknowledge that I'm uncomfortable, right? And and give me that space and then maybe we can re-engage later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I need to feel like I'm empowered to do so and the current situation, the current structure, the current system did not give me that space. Yeah. And, and so in the legislative process, um, when it came back from the Senate, they had added on amendments that we had actually suggested <laughs> in the House that were rejected. Yeah. The independent investigator, um, I, had, I had written and offered those amendments, and when the bill was voted out of the House, they didn't even take up the amendments. Um, I, I didn't, and it was interesting, when it was voted out of the House, we knew the vote was happening, but like, for instance, we weren't told whether or not we can attend. And, and some vote sessions with the committees of, um, in Annapolis, they don't like you to attend their sessions. Okay. Um, and and my amendment, and, and so people came back to me and they said, we heard your amendments, but nobody even took them up. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, and they said, well, you know, and I said, well, why? And they said, well, you weren't there. I said, nobody told me to be there, or I would have advocated for it. And I didn't want to, because what can happen is if you show up, sometimes that will anger people, mm -hmm. and they will, they will not, yeah. they will vote your stuff down. Like, there are certain committees it's known if you show up and advocate for your things, they'll vote it down because they don't like that. So, oh, wow. so we didn't know. So when our amendments weren't even discussed mm -hmm. um, and weren't voted on, when it came out of the House, I was like, well, you know, the Senate is going to be even harder to get it through. And so I was so pleasantly surprised when it came back from the Senate, and it was an even stronger mm -hmm. bill. And, and but, but I'll tell you, Nina, I was like, now I know it's not passing. <laughs> I, I, I literally told her, I, I, because this is what happens, you know, like you'll get something and then, you know, there's other bills that died on the House floor that night that just the House never, um, because when it comes back to the Senate and it's, and it's been changed, the House has to then approve the Senate changes. Okay. And so that's where another place like legislation gets held up or it dies because if the House doesn't approve it, you go to conference committee and you're all this is running out, it's a, sand, it's a clock, right? It's all and you're you running could actually out. run out of time because it's, this yeah, is the it, last day of session, right? Day of session. So, so, the so that's when ticking. I, exactly. So mm -hmm. I was like, and, and especially since the amendments that the House had refused to take up, the Senate had added on. So I, and, So you assumed then quite understandably that it meant it wasn't gonna pass in the House. Exactly, yeah. because, uh, because what happens is sometimes the House will then strip the Senate's amendments and then send it back to the Senate. There's all types of games that we play. Mm -hmm. So, so I was like, up to the last day, I was telling them, I was like, this isn't passing. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's not. I was like, and they, and they were, you know, they, they were overjoyed. I was, I was like, it's not happening because I had, I've lived this. I've lived this for four years, and I was a staffer before, um, and I, and I know how ingrained this culture is. And so, you know, I was like, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. And um, when it did, I was like, we vote, you know, and I voted, you know, because the, the, it comes up for the, um, on the floor and, and it says, you know, ratifying or accepting the Senate's amendment. And I was like, somebody, you know, I was like, I was like, are we accepting these amendments? Yeah. And, um, you know, and I was so, and I pressed the button and I like, after I pressed it, I text them. I was like, we just approved, like the bill, I was like, the bill is law. And, and for me, that must I, have been an incredible feeling. <laughs> it, <laughs> I, you know, I, it, it was one of the, you know, there are many, there haven't been a lot of times, I will say, as my time in the house, um, you know, and, and I, I'm blessed. I, I was in the house for four years. I'm on it, so I will no longer be in the house, um, you know, win or lose. That was still, this is my four years is done. But I think in, in these past four years, I think that was one of the very few times, like, I was, like, honestly floored. And, 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 and we shocked my, and, 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 and shocked in a good way. Right. Um, because there's been so many times that, you know, we've let down, I think, the people of Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we just haven't, especially victims and especially women. There's been so many times when we just haven't stood um, for them. And, and so when, to press that button and to see the bill, especially the stronger bill pass, um, it was a point of like, okay, um, one, it made it worthwhile, like it made mm -hmm. it worth it. Mm -hmm. Because there were times I know, um, especially Nina sharing her story, 
um, mm -hmm. me and if you've heard my testimony um, when I testified, I was testifying before the committee with people in the room who had done some of the things I was describing. Oh, God. You know? Okay, um, oh, God. And, 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 and. Were they able to, I mean, what, what, when you're, you're testifying, the person who was your abuser, who was a predator, is across the room from you. Are, are they making eye contact with you? Are they looking away? Like, what, what's happening in that moment? I mean, <laughs> you know, all, all, all types of things. Um, you know, if you, if you look in, and when I'm testifying, for the most part, I just kind of kept my eyes down. I kind of looked. Okay. Um, so you avoided I the avoided, eye contact or, or having to deal with whatever facial expression they might be projecting towards you. Exactly. Okay. Although occasionally I did, I did look up. You know, and, and I know some of the people that were either witnesses to some of the things, you know, people looked very uncomfortable. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will, I will say that. And then, you know, when my staffer who, who, who was familiar with it, you know, she, you know, later reported, you know, they looked very stone-faced and at times looked very uncomfortable or flustered. Um, but, you know, seeing all of that and, and knowing that and, and having lived through it and having lived through, um, honestly, a system that, um, where you haven't been protected, um, you know, I'm a, a, um, I'm a survivor of, of sexual abuse. I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Um, there, I've survived a lot of things. Um, but I will say, you know, sitting in the house where I'm, not that you're supposed to be, but where I'm supposed to be able to feel empowered, where I'm supposed to be able to feel like this is my space to fight for the people of my district. Um, having experienced four years where there were times when I was completely victimized, and not only was I victimized by what was happening to me, but I was victimized by the fact that I was powerless to, to change it, to fight against it, or to even report it. Um, right. that, was, that was something that was very soul mm -hmm. shattering. Um, so to be able to see that bill pass, to say that, you know, and who knows, but to say that like we've, we've made it to where this is not okay. Um, it, was, it, was, it was empowering in a way that I can't, can't describe. You know, it, it was like, this is what I've done this for. So maybe, you know, um, oh gosh, I don't wanna get, I hate, you know, I'm there's no, no hard <laughs> getting emotional there's no, I always, I always tell you, I'm like, there's no crying in politics, you know, <laughs> like, like um, but this is why you did it. Mm -hmm. um, this is why, if, if for nothing, if for no other reasons, um, if God forbid I don't go back to the Senate, if I can say that there's a woman that's coming in next round right. that will be protected. Right. Yeah, it was worth it. It was worth it. Mm -hmm. right. I absolutely agree that this incredible work that you have all done, that you've shared in together to protect women in Annapolis, I think it's something that you can be incredibly proud of. And I, I think that you really all need to be commended for your bravery, for being willing to stand up and tell your own stories and to be in the same room as those who tried to victimize you and be able to confront them is absolutely something that needs to be respected and should be inspiring to others. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank my guests, Brittany Oliver, Nina Smith, and Delegate Angela Angel for joining me for this important conversation and sharing their truths with me. And I want to thank you for joining me, your host, Taya Graham, at The Real News Network.